what's the number one way that we get late blight earlier than we should? It's the only way we get it. Well, there's two now. There used to only be one way. But thanks to Lowe's and Walmart, there's two ways. Um, I think it was three years ago now, three seasons before, before this tomato season, Lowe's and Walmart shipped up late blight infect infected tomatoes all over the country. And people who never had late blight had terrible outbreaks, and they could follow the outbreak back to the store, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one way. The other way, anybody got a guess? Leaving the old plants in. Pardon? Leaving the debris of old plants in. Well, you're, you're close. That's, that's close. It's a little more specific than that. Okay, here's the big hint. What other plants get late blight besides tomatoes? Potatoes. potatoes. What do we like to do when we see potatoes come up from the year before? Mm. Leave them in the ground, get some early potatoes, right? Yeah. Is that a good idea? If there was no late blight the year before, which we have, right? We're in a drought year, right? We don't see late blight, right? There's no late blight. You know, we have a drought year. If you get late blight, you're doing something wrong, you know? Because it's just too dry for late blight, okay? We get it in those cool, wet years, right? So in a dry year, you got potatoes coming up. You don't have to worry about it. You know, there's not going to be any late blight on it, you know? But if you had late blight, you know, or late blight was in your area, do not let your volunteer potatoes up. Now know that that just does so much good. It's like getting rid of the dock. How far can you go? Because your neighbor's going to let their volunteer potatoes up. But at least you'll slow it down and reduce the casual infection. Where conditions were marginal, and you may not have, might not have gotten it, you know. Or slow it down so you have time to be ready for it. You know, you find out you know, all your neighbors are losing it. You haven't lost it yet. And you can get, you know, figure out your sprays. Go get that sprayer you never wanted to buy because you know you can't stand to try and squeeze a little bottle, you know, I mean, those kinds of things, you know. <laughs> Figure out that if you get the homeowner's serenade, you'll have to mortgage your house to use it, you know. You have to get a bigger spray amount than that, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so mulching, you know, and the other thing you can use is, is some kind of fabric or plastic. It'll do the same thing. It's just separating your plant from that soil splash, you know. That's a great way to reduce disease. Um, Okay, stay out of the garden when it's wet. That doesn't mean that you're gonna you want your dinner and you're dying to go get you know some food. You want fresh food that you can't go in and quickly grab some food. I do that. That's for sure. It would really be best practice not to, but I do it. You know. Uh, but don't go pick the bean beetles off the beans because they don't move that fast when it's wet. You know, because you, beans in particular are very susceptible to to human vector diseases. A lot of the diseases they get are easily vectored by humans. And so stay away from plants like beans in particular. Peas are another one, right? That you can easily move the disease to. Okay. And basically, if you can, just stay out of your garden when it's wet. That is easier said than done in some of our summers. You know, some of our summers, the garden's wet all the time. You know? And you got to make the decision, okay. But with beans, too. Okay, I've had weeks where, all right, I got a choice. I risk infection or I let the beans run out of production because they're going to set seed. You know, because once they start setting seed, they never really come back from production, you know. Um, and so at a certain point, I go, okay, they're going to set seed, I have to pick them. Yeah. But as much as possible, stay out of the garden or the farm when it's wet. Yeah. You, you'll spread way less disease. And also, be careful, I said this in the beginning, of where you go and then come back to your garden or farm or somebody else's garden or farm. You know, um, a particularly, you know, painful example of that is that Quetopter capsici or the Cinnamome. Both of those can be transferred easily from infected soil. Yeah. So just pay attention, you know. And, and one of the things I love about gardening is it brings out the generosity in us. And that means if you go to somebody's garden, they're going to offer you plants, right? I mean, it's pretty hard to go visit a garden without, without getting offered some plants or some seeds, you know. And that's fine. But ask them if they have any disease problems with those plants or seeds. Pay attention to that. And it's probably the same problems you have, and it doesn't matter. You know? If they have Cercospora, you have Cercospora, what's the difference? You know? uh, but if they have something you've never had, you don't want to bring it to your garden or your farm. You know? So just be, you know, that kind of stuff is pretty important to you. Know? Oh, we got Hector in there. I did this with voice to text if you see some weird things. And I try and prove it, but they sometimes get away. Um, how did you do that? What? Oh, it's, it's, it's called Nuance. It cost about, I don't know, 
maybe the first time for a home version, it's a hundred bucks. Way better for me. I'm a very slow typist. You know? um, but it does things like stick Hector in there. You know? <laughs> I have no idea what word is supposed to be there. You know, it's what it thinks I'm saying. Um, um, I know that sprays were um, pays. Is what it said originally. You know, so I have to. I, I do a lot of. You know, but I miss some. They just slip by over here. Zoned out. Okay. Um, and then actually, the next one is where I should have talked about potatoes, but it's, it's the same thing. Practice thoughtful garden farm sanitation. And why I say that is what I used to preach and what I learned is come fall, clean <coughs> it out. Everything gets tilled under a compost. There's nothing left from the year before. There's a problem with that. Okay? <coughs> it makes it hard because for disease, that's absolutely the best thing to do. But really, for proper creation of a really stable, dynamic insect population. If you wipe out all the plants that the insects were on, you're also wiping out the predators that use those same plants as harborage in the wintertime. You want some stubble from a little patch of broccoli, from a little patch of squash, you know, um, so you get the beneficials too. You know, and that's, that's kind of a dicey thing because of course, you know, you can also get disease. You might get vine borer more quickly. You know, the same farm that doesn't have a um, problem with Cercospora doesn't have a problem with vine borer. It's like, I want to farm where you farm, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're just far enough away from where anybody's growing squash, I guess the vine borer doesn't make it there. You know? So, you know, were they to bring in a vine borer? That's nah, not too likely. That's a bad example. If somehow they got one vine borer, like, stumbled into there, right, and they didn't destroy that, that vine, then maybe they would have vine borers the next year. Yeah. But for me, I always have vine borers. So if I leave a little bit of squash out, you know, a little bit of uh, brassicas, just a little bit, you know, it's okay. By and large, though, I want the great bulk of it to be turned under or composted. If you can't do that, let's say you're doing fruit trees, right? Then it's really a good idea to come back at the end of the season, spray compost tea, and 10% molasses in the tank things. And what you do is you create a feeding frenzy, right? You put all this bacteria out there and food. And they just start eating and multiplying, right? But what would happen if like right here all of us started procreating so that all of a sudden we ate everything that was here, right? We might start looking at things like shoelaces or maybe maybe before shoelaces, belts, belts you know, maybe each other, whatever, right? Eventually, Everything that's edible gets eaten, right? That's the theory of putting the molasses out. You know, normal, normally those disease organisms wouldn't be food, but if there's super high levels of life, they become food too. You know? And this was a tip from a guy named Ron Stewart who died of a heart attack before he, before he wrote his book on organic apple production, and I wish he'd written that book. Because uh, you know, he has a bunch of great tips like that, and I never hear, see him anywhere else. She so said that was a postseason spray? Yeah, you do that postseason, yeah. Um, and meanwhile, you're feeding the plant otherwise, too. I mean, you could also have, you know, fish emulsion in there to feed the plant. But actually, for postseason on fruit trees, there's no reason to. Mm -hmm. You don't want to feed them, really. You want them down, you know. Mm -hmm. You want them going hard, hardening off, you know. But you could do that in your greenhouse, you know. I mean, years ago, we actually went to the point of, only two years ago, I guess, um, spraying the entire number one propagation house with oxidate because a few seasons of growers hadn't realized that they, you know, not only did they have a problem as far as production was going to be because of a bad early blight infection on their seedlings. Basically, they let their seedlings get too big in their in their pots, and that stressed them enough that they got early blight. But they also filled the greenhouse with early blight spores. So then, when you try to grow early blight in there, you get early blight even if you were taking care of your seedlings because there was so much infectious material. So we actually sprayed the entire greenhouse with oxidate. We might have been successful with compost tea and um, molasses. Could have been a little sticky. <laughs> but it might have been as successful. We could have then power, you know, we also totally pressure washed it. We got rid of our infection in that greenhouse though. And that happens sometimes, you have to take those kinds of steps. If you realize what I'm working with is so infected, I must sterilize it if I want to keep using it. I never sterilize my pots, by the way, unless I have a problem. 
because I trust that the compost I have and the heavily composted soils I have and my organic techniques mean that I don't have diseases that spread to my pots, and they don't. But if I have pots that have had a disease, those get sterilized. And the rest of them is just not worth the work. Okay? So we just dump the soil out, stack them up, let them bake in the greenhouse, and use them again. Can you go back over and uh, just clarify a little bit on what you were saying about like till 90% in the fall, but leave some stubble? Yeah, pick some arborage spots, right? Arborage. Yeah, where, where the beneficial insects, along with the pest, I'll give you that, right? Uh -huh. Can hatch out. Yeah. And you'll have higher levels of predators. And that we're going to go ahead and cover that in great detail in the uh, July workshop. That's Dr. Richard McDonald and myself. That's farmscaping and, you know, organic insect control. And we'll go into that, you know, we'll give all kinds of examples of, you okay. know, plant combinations that have been successful and stuff like that. You know. But it is about allowing some arborage spaces, or refuges, whatever you want to call them, the insects, the predators can overwinter too. You know. Eventually they're all going to get, get here anyways, but the problem is what has to get here first is the prey, you know. And so if you already have the predator here looking for the prey, you're way better off. If you have to wait for the prey to find the, the prey to be found by the predator, then things can get a little ahead. You know? And it's kind of scary, you know. You're playing with fire a little bit there, <laughs> but I, you know, I've learned that it's it works pretty well. You know, um, I would confess that we need to, in the very immediate future, go pull all of our remaining brassicas because we don't want them to become a breeding place for the harlequin bugs. You know, right now they're a trap crop, and you know, we don't have so many that we can't get all the bugs and wipe them out. But we don't have much longer before they start dispersing, and then we're in big trouble. You know? um, and so that kind of thoughtful garden sanitation is real important. Um, and indeed, you know, the doc, you know, you want to try and get rid of as much dock as you can. Get rid of your vectors. By the way, evening primrose also appears to be a vector for doc. I'll have to run it by a pathologist, but it sure looks like that's Doc on its leaves, too. I mean, not Doc, Sarcospora, you know. Um, and so you just want to pay attention to what weeds are problems. If you grow brassicas, much as I love the creasy greens, you might not want large numbers of them. They are wonderful early flowers for the beneficials, but they will be an early infection site for the Altamaria, you know. Um, and so... Just once again, balance, try and keep the populations lower. You know, don't try and have, don't wipe them out, but don't have tons of them. Um, likewise for the dock, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'd say wipe out dock. Uh, at least not curly dock. Curly dock's a, an important medicinal. But get it knocked way down, you know. And I just thought of it, I never thought of it before. If you, if you only have a little population, if you are treating your um, sarcospa, which I'm not sure I've ever had an effect from treating it, but if you're trying to treat it, spray your dock too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may not ever think of protecting a weed, but if you can keep it from being the vector, you know, if they could have inoculated Typhoid Mary so she wouldn't keep spreading it, they wouldn't have had to, you know, isolate her. So Pat, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Patrick, did I understand you to say that you're thinking about going in and harvesting brassicas soon for the purpose of avoiding infestation with harlequin? Yeah, well, if we've got a special situation, I'm hoping to walk the whole farm and show you. Okay. We had harlequin bucks really bad last year. Uh -huh. They're probably my greatest failing. I mean, I just don't think we've got a good control on them yet, you know, um, even though I've learned lots about them. And so we decided, and once again, they were never that bad for me because I never let them build up, right? Before I got here, um, the growers are great. They're really good growers. Um, but they didn't have that, they didn't have their antennas up on that about not letting them build up. They just thought, okay, the Darren brassicas go down bad in the, in the summertime anyways, we're just not going to grow them. But they would let the populations build up before they pulled them all out. And so then as soon as they put them in again in fall, they could be multiplying. So they had much higher populations than I had in Sela, uh, where I just by, you know, basically, you know, controlling them early, I didn't have a big problem with them. Here they were at high populations, so we had problems. So what we've come up with is this main garden here, why it's so in cover crops and doesn't look very planted, is because what do we plant first, right? Basically brassicas, right? Um, all of our brassicas are several houses over in a backyard. You know, we have the side of a, a hill in brassicas. 
And so the only brassicas that are out here right now are ones that we've left to feed beneficial insects and provide refuge or our bridge for the beneficials as they come out. So they're all coming out now as trap crops because they aren't even meant for food anymore. You've got a dance to do if you're trying to grow brassicas for food, you know, and you want to try and get rid of the uh, uh, pests like the harlequin bug, you know. On your scale, I'd say probably early hand picking is the best by far, uh -huh. you know. The earlier the better. If you can get at them before they spread out, uh -huh. they're much easier to control because they're gregarious. They hang out together to yeah. protect their eggs from wasps that, that, prey, that prey on their eggs. Mm -hmm. And if you can get them before they decide, okay, we're going to gamble now and start new colonies, you know, which they'll also do the same thing, but once they spread out, it's so much more work. You know? mm -hmm. So that's why we'll be pulling them all out. You know? We'll be doing that kind of predation.